for the sixth Sunday in Ordinary Time. When I pray, what do I usually ask from Jesus? How much of the way I live helps people think about the presence of Christ in the world, in me, and perhaps in themselves? The first reading is from the book of Leviticus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, If someone has on his skin a scab or pustule or blotch, which appears to be the sore of leprosy, he shall be brought to Aaron the priest, or to one of the priests among his descendants. If the man is leprous and unclean, the priest shall declare him unclean by reason of the sore on his head. The one who bears the sore of leprosy shall keep his garments rent and his head bare, and shall muffle, muffle his beard. He shall cry out, Unclean! Unclean! As long as the sore is on him, he shall declare himself unclean, since he is in fact unclean. He shall dwell apart, making his abode outside the camp. The second reading is from the first letters to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, whatever you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Avoid giving offense, whether to the Greeks or Jews or the Church of God, just as I try to please everyone in every way not seeking my own benefit, but that of the many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, as I am of Christ. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Let us be attentive to the wisdom of Jesus Christ. A leper came to Jesus, and kneeling down, begged him and said, If you wish, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand, touched him, and said to him, I do will it, be made clean. The leprosy left him immediately, and he was made clean. Then warning him sternly, he dismissed him at once. He said to him, See that you tell no one anything, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer offer for your cleansing what Moses prescribed. That will be proof for them. The man went away and began to publicize the whole matter. He spread the report abroad so that it was impossible for Jesus to enter a town openly. He remained outside in deserted places, and people kept coming to him from everywhere. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I just want to mention two things that we just listened to. They're not part of the homily, uh, but they're so kind of central that I think it's worth taking a very brief moment to refer to them. The responsory we sang, the Lord is kind and merciful. Kind and merciful in Hebrew religious experience is the expression for the way God, Yahweh, kept his part of the covenant. He was faithful to the covenant by being kind and merciful. Especially the merciful part, and if you read the Old Testament, you see this, they realized it more and more, by entering into the chaos of their life. Mercy in large part means to enter the pain and chaos of the other and to bring it into your own life. The Lord is kind and merciful. It's a hugely deep expression, one that we're invited to recognize in our own life more and more. And the other one, where Paul says, be imitators of me. The reason Paul could imitate Jesus is that he experienced him, that mysterious event on the way to Damascus. He actually met Jesus in some unique way that the others who came after the death of Jesus did not. So he could, a little like Moses, met God on the mountain and therefore could tell you how to live according to God's wisdom in the Hebrews. So Paul met Jesus and by his followers, the people he taught, doing what he did, they too would enter. That actually is a big part of the homily, but I'll come back to that in a minute. I'd like to uh, start by asking you to uh, keep in mind a question. This is a test about the homily. That is, the question is, because I've had this in my mind since yesterday when I was particularly working on this, the famous quote from Jesus, you have not chosen me, I have chosen you. I'd like you to keep that in mind and see why it seems to me that that's an important key to everything I want to say now. Why would I, and why would that become kind of haunting 
in um, my mind which has been trying to grapple with the things I've been grappling with. You have not chosen, say to yourself, Smith, you have not chosen me. The I, of course, is Jesus, the risen Christ. I have chosen you. To set the frame for this and for the year, I mentioned that we, all through this year, will be reading Mark's Gospel, listening to Mark's Gospel in the Scriptures. There are two themes in, why is it important to listen to the gospel? Not because it's a story, not because it's a history. It's not meant to come to know better like the facts of the life of Jesus. This is not a history, not even a theological history. There is a theological history in the New Testament called the Acts of the Apostles. But this is a gospel. That is to say, this was written, as I mentioned a lot of times, so that those who really penetrate it, those for whom it becomes a gospel, will encounter the risen Christ. The reason we come back over and over again to the gospel is that each year, different times of the year, we are more prepared by God's grace to for this revelation of scripture, this gospel of Jesus, to draw us into an encounter with Christ. The encounter with Christ is not going to be some special experience that I have, some quasi-mystical experience. Rather, it's going to be a way of living an ordinary human life. What the gospel does, as it becomes the word of God for me, God's self-revelation of himself and me, is that it allows me, us, together and alone, to recognize in the different dimensions of a human life what it means to experience that birth, death, pain, fear, job, sex, pain, whatever, food, as an encounter with the risen Christ. And what it means to, to do what it means to do what you and I are doing right now as an encounter, that, that it become an encounter with the risen Christ. It's not automatically an encounter with the risen Christ. The liturgy is not automatically a meeting with Christ. The scriptures are meant to enable us to live. And it's not it's going to be an encounter in faith and hope and love, I mean, we know that. Okay, so there are two themes, among others, in Mark's Gospel. One I mentioned at the very beginning, that in order to know who is Christ, that's one of the themes. Again, not an intellectual answer but an answer that allows me to, in a real way, experience the risen Christ. Who is he? What am I experiencing? And part of the answer I mentioned in Mark is, he's the one who died. You don't know who the risen Christ is until you know the crucified Christ. But there's another thing which I think is relevant in Mark's, to this reading today, and that is the theme of discipleship. What does it mean to be a disciple? We are disciples of Christ. What does it mean to be a disciple? Again, if it's tiresome, not an intellectual answer, but a kind of knowledge that allows me to act or to experience, to know in this way, the way I know someone whom I love or who loves me, someone with whom I work or who works me, not just an intellectual, not knowledge about the person, but knowledge of the person. Not just believing that Jesus did this and this and this, but as we're going to say in a couple of minutes, believing in him. Committing, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Lord. Not, I believe that he did this stuff. That's not, it's not an intellectual prayer. It's, it's, a, it's a statement. Commit, I believe in you. Would you marry me? I believe in you. Do you want to do this together? I believe in him. And notice at the end of it, we say to one another, I believe in you. I commit myself to the Holy Catholic Church, to this community of disciples. But what does it mean to be a disciple? One of the scripture scholars says that one way Mark answers this is to say that to be a disciple is to be with Jesus and to do what Jesus did. To be with Jesus and to do what Jesus did. Now we come to the Gospel reading today, the, the beginning of the gospel reading. Okay. This business of leprosy. 
It's very important in the beginning to recognize what this is. First of all, I, mean, I suppose everybody right now knows that it's not leprosy that we have since disease. But because obviously, this is first of all curable. <laughs> There's a whole ritual about how you get declared cured. It's, it's actually, if you would say, it's any kind of skin disease, some kind of skin disease. And the reason it was so important, and the first reading mentioned this, is that it rendered you unclean. It wasn't so much, I think, that you were dangerous to the community. I doubt that in 1,000, 900, 2,000, whatever it was years ago, they really knew about infectious disease. I doubt it, really, <laughs> or thought about it. But they did think about the worshiping community. If you were imperfect in any way, visibly, you were unfit to be part of the worshiping community. You were ritually unclean. If you were contaminated by somebody who was unfit, distorted in any way, grotesquely, cruel, whatever they made you, you were unfit to be part of the worshiping community. But since the worshiping community was the whole community, that made you an outsider. And that's what's you know. So if you come, and then there's a ritual, if you do get cleaned up, you know, if it goes away, you go to the priest, and the priest has some ritual, that he, and then he declares you clean. You're back now in the community. That's the background to the story of Mark. Remember, this is at the very beginning of Mark's gospel. This is just beginning to recognize Jesus and who Jesus was. What is significant about the story, the way Mark tells it, for this business of coming to encounter Jesus? First of all, he touches him. Who is Jesus? We're beginning, beginning to get some insight into him. He is able to render the unclean clean. He's able to, he's not contaminated by the touch, but he heals by the touch. He renders, and this is closer to what I want us to think about right now, he makes the community whole. That's what Mark is saying. He's the one, in fact, we're going to see through his death and resurrection. Where did he touch the unclean most? By becoming sin for us in the crucifixion. And he creates a whole new community, possibility of community. I think the other thing I just want to mention, it seems to me, if you look at this passage and realize that Mark is not just writing a history, he's not just telling a story, it's full of reference to liturgy. It's a liturgical act that he has Jesus doing. To touch the marginal and to draw the marginal into the life of the community. I think you can't help in our day anyway, certainly it wasn't in Mark's mind because confession and reconciliation didn't exist in this way at the beginning of the church, not for a long time. But still, the ritual of sacramental reconciliation, what do you want from me? I want to be made whole. But also, the ritual of the Eucharist, obviously. You come to the Eucharist, you're encountering can it be an encounter with Christ? Yes. Is it automatically an encounter with Christ? No. Is receiving the Eucharist automatically an encounter with Christ? No. If you just go to communion because you're here, I want to be made whole. So, let me just make a few suggestions about what this might be for, how we, this might make up our ordinary life an encounter with Christ. That is to say, to be with Jesus and to do what Jesus did. Take it from the side that we baptized our Christ in the world, and so we are the ones who can touch the marginalized, who can reach out to those who are on not whole, and therefore, for whatever reason, are not part of the community. I would like to make a suggestion, though, that the place to begin with this is the way we pray. Not because I think just praying is enough. Obviously, if all you do is pray about this, then you never act, then you're not really Christ in the world. You're not a disciple of Christ. You're halfway, but not there. But, about, but I still think the way we pray is a way of acting. And it has a lot to do with, like, in your prayer, how much do you, and I'm asking myself, I'm saying it to you, but this is not 
you know, somebody who does all this. It's, it just works better than to preach and to say you. That's more punch, I guess. When you pray, how often do you pray for Al-Qaeda? How often do any of us, how often you've been in a Catholic church in the last six years where we pray for our enemies, as Jesus told us to? We pray all the time, we did, for the soldiers. How often do I pray for the enemy, not just for them, that they may be made whole, for we, that we may be made whole together? He reached out to the marginal one and touched him because he needed to be touched and healed. So in the practice, I just, just try this. Stop praying for enemies. Think about politics. We're all involved in politics. How many of us who really are urgent about politics ever pray for the people we disagree with? That we will become part of one people. That we will become whole. See, the Jews at the time knew they were a community, and so to be outside the community was really bad. We don't really know we're a community. We're a bunch of individuals who think, well, you do what you do, and I do what I do. We need disciples of Jesus to have this sense, no, 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 we're supposed to be ultimately one community around the altar. That's going to be a long time. A community in Christ, do everything for the glory of God, Paul said. But we have to get beyond the idea that I'll leave you alone, you leave me alone, we say. How much do you, how often do you pray for the people you dislike in your dorm or, you know, or people who, who genuinely I dislike, you know, or don't, or even just people that don't matter to me, people who are not, how much, how often, while you're at the Eucharist, do you pray for the other people at the Eucharist, or do I just pray for myself? To do what Jesus did is to heal the community to touch the marginalized, to awaken in them the healing. In the church, you may not know this because you may not be very interested in what's going on in the Catholic Church, you may not follow it very much, but if you do, you would know that the Catholic Church throughout the world and in the United States is deeply divided, hostile to one another, angry at one another, dismissing one another. How often do the sides who sincerely are discussing what did the Second Vatican Council mean? How do we live it? What's the role of women in the church? What do we do about sexuality? I mean, and deeper, who is Christ? And all of these things. What's authority in the church? Who has it? And how do those of us who don't have authority relate to the ones with it? All of that. How often do we pray for one another? We have to do more than pray. But if we started praying for one another, real prayer for one another, how much of my prayer is just occupied with me and the people I like and the people who are close to me? If we really prayed for them, if we did what Jesus did, how much would we discover we could do to build up a wholeness between, to rescue the marginalized, whatever they are, for whatever reason, the standard of race and sex? But also, we are the one coming to Jesus. We are not fully whole to be able to enter this Eucharist, to be part of the community. And that's going to go back to the thing I said. If you go to the Eucharist, if you're here anyway, whether you receive or not, you're in the presence of the risen Christ in the most powerful way. And I'm asked, if you receive the Eucharist, Christ, what do you want from me? Do I really know do I really say to Christ, I want to be healed? I want to be made more whole? Or do I go to communion thinking, I'm pretty good, I'm okay. No big, you know, no big problems. Maybe I don't even know what I need to be healed from. So why did I ask that question at the beginning? You have not chosen me, I have chosen you. Because I was thinking, about why should you do any of these things? I tell you all this stuff. Why should you bother to make all this effort? Why should I bother to make all this effort to change the way I pray? Because if I don't pray the way I just described, in fact. Because it's a part of, it's the center of the search for who I really am. To discover who I really am. To discover the self I must lose and find the self I must find. Because I am a disciple of Christ. Why am I that? Not because I decided it, but because for whatever accident of history, I find myself standing here, you find yourself sitting there. You did not choose Christ.
Christ chose you and me. And that's the first act of belief that leads us into all the rest of this.